So hopefully you're seeing slides. If you're not seeing slides, let me know. I'm also opening up the chat. Okay, so my name is Carrie Price. I am the Research Impact and Health Professions Librarian at the Cook Library. My email is here. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm happy for you to contact me now um, after this session if you have questions about Scopus for your research. So today we'll talk about what is Scopus and some of the really unique things that it can do. It can capture article metrics. It can provide you with author profiles for yourself or others. It can provide some journal metrics. You can find funders and grants and Scopus. One thing I didn't add here, but I think I'll I'll show you today is how to look up things institutionally, and we'll have time for a question and answer. Please note that captions are enabled if you would prefer to use captions for today's session. So what is Scopus? Scopus is a very large bibliographic database from the publisher Elsevier. It covers four broad areas of the sciences, physical sciences, health sciences, social sciences, life sciences. It's been online since 2004. And when I said large, it's very large, over 91 million records, very multidisciplinary. It's a great place to start your research. It contains journal articles, articles in press, so articles before they've hit print or um, formal online publishing. It contains book chapters and books, conference proceedings, by which they say conference papers, not conference abstracts, although I've seen both. It contains patents, editorials, errata, retractions, and more. And I linked here to a, a nice info sheet from Scopus that is a little bit more detailed, but it gives you a really good idea of what's covered. So we'll be looking at those some of those pieces in a minute. And I'll put this in the chat. Scopus at a glance. These are some of the publishers indexed in Scopus you'll see on the left. So these may be familiar to you. On the right, you'll see some of the articles, 27.9 um, active titles, 20, 292,000 standalone books and more records. It also contains 49.2 million patent records. So if you're a patent researcher, it's a great place to, to look. What makes Scopus unique? It contains author profiles with metrics. So if you've written or published or someone you know has written or published, even though you didn't sign into Scopus and you didn't create it the self, yourself, it's still going to create some author profiles for you. So you can look people up and be quite the detective. It contains impact metrics for journals, articles, and authors. It allows you to do forward and backward citation searching. So if you find one really good article, you can see which article cited that article and which articles that article cited. It provides visualizations of search results. It sorts by number of citations, which allows you to find seminal articles in a field. And it contains some historical literature. So even though most of it is pretty modern, there are 6.5 million records going back before 1970, as far as 1788. So that's pretty hard to believe. I haven't located that one record from 1788 yet, but they say it's in there. It is located on our A to Z library list. So I'm going to walk you over to the Cook Library website, your portal for all things research, and bring your attention to the databases A to Z button on the left. Click on that. You can go to S. You can search for Scopus. And here it is. I'll invite you at this point, if anybody has a topic that they have in mind that they would like to see researched, please drop it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll probably use some general topics off the top of my head. Okay, so that's how you find it. It is a subscription database, so you have it as long as you're at Towson. After you leave Towson, you may not have it. Many institutions do purchase this resource, so you may have it in the future as well. But just be aware that it's not freely available to the public. 
Shipwrecks. Okay, you guys are always giving me the hard, the hard ones. Okay, we'll look at some of those things. So when we're looking at some of these metrics, the things that come with the author metrics and the article metrics, it's limited to what's been indexed in Scopus. So it's not everything in the world that's ever existed, but everything that's in Scopus, which is a lot, but it's not everything. So everything we find in Scopus comes with that caveat. This is limited to what's indexed in Scopus. Let's look at some article level metrics in Scopus. You can use Scopus to visualize a field. Um, so when you search on your keyword terms to find articles on your topic, and you can use filters on the left to refine the search, then you can analyze the results and view different tiles. So let me go out on a limb here and try, <laughs> let me try shipwrecks. Uh, is that Daniel? Is is it shipwrecks in a specific location or shipwrecks uh, in general? Uh, in general. In general. Okay. So I'm going to put a star here on the end because if we capture, we might capture shipwreck. We might capture shipwrecks. We might add the Titanic if we need to narrow it down. Let's see. And... 3,602, it just occurred to me that an author might say shipwreck. Sorry, I can't type. Or shipwrecks. So this is just a little tiny searching lesson for you that we have to search with the words that the authors used or else we will not find the, uh, the articles that they wrote. So they may have used any of these variations. We found shipwreck as one word, plural. Shipwreck as two words, both singular and plural and we'll click search again. Okay, so we have 3,702 documents. Considering there are over 90 million records in this database, that's a pretty good set. So over here, you'll see a place where you can limit by date. So maybe the most recent literature on shipwrecks from 1999 to 2004, and then we'll hit that arrow and it will refresh. There are other things you can do over here. There are authors who are publishing in this field. You can see their names. There are subject areas. So maybe this falls into earth and planetary sciences or environmental science. And those are the ones that you're interested in. Maybe you only want articles and not book chapters or books. Maybe you're looking for titles from a specific source, a specific journal. It gives you some other ideas here for keywords. You can limit to affiliation. I don't know. You can limit to funding sponsor, country, source type, and language, and finally, open access. But the part that I wanted to show you about this is once you've run a search and you like the results and you'd like to visualize those results, you'll go over here to the right and you'll click on analyze results. and give it a minute to think. And you'll see here the number of results by year. So it really took off. The asterisk in the search finds both shipwreck singular and shipwreck plural. So at the end of any word, you can add a, an asterisk if you think there might be variations. You can see that it really takes off and then it plummeted this year because we're not finished this year yet. But there are other tiles here so if you click on documents by source, you can see, and it limits you to the top five, you can see that the top five journals publishing on shipwreck material, shipwreck topics, are the International Journal of Nautical Archaeology, and then these four, and it shows you there are 206 records here, 72, 57, 44, and so on. So you, this may be a place for you to look for journals, but we're get it, we'll get into that a little bit later on. There are other tiles down here, documents by author. So you've run your search and you've visualized the results. You're going to see who are the big hitters in this field. So this person, D. Zwickel, has published quite a lot on shipwrecks. And these are all interactive. So if you click on this bar, you'll get to their publications. 
And you can see now that it's limited to this author, which has an ID. Let's go back. We did documents by year, documents by source. We did documents by author. Another one is documents by affiliation. So where is the shipwreck literature coming from? The University of Haifa, Texas A&M, Flinders, that's in Australia, Oxford in the UK. And again, they're all interactive. And you can play with this visualization by saying, oh, I'd, write, I'd like to see the top 20, and you can click them all. You can do documents by country. So here we see the countries publishing on shipwrecks. You can see documents by type. Majority of these are articles. However, there are conference papers, book chapters, reviews, books, notes, don't know what that would be, short surveys, conference review, editorial, other. And then we have documents by subject area. So they're falling into mostly arts and humanities, social sciences, earth and planetary science, and some others. And this is just based on the way that Scopus indexes their literature, but it might help you form a more robust idea of your topic. Finally, the last tile is documents by funding sponsor. So you'll be able to see who's funded this kind of research and that might give you some ideas for who might fund your research. The Na National Natural Science Foundation of China, the National Science Foundation, the University of Haifa, and the complete list is over here on the left. So that's visualizing a field. Now these don't export very well, but if you are trying to export them, to show in a presentation or something, I usually just use a screen clipper and grab an image from the screen. I think that's fair within um, fair use. You could use that. Let's go back. So we, we used Scopus, Scopus to visualize a field. You can also use Scopus to find highly cited articles. So we're going to go back to our search results. We had our, just our shipwreck search results, 3,284. Currently they're sorted by date, but Scopus, unlike many other databases, gives you the opportunity to sort by cited by highest. And when you sort by cited by highest, you'll notice this column on the far right that shows you which articles have been cited the most. So this article from 2000 in the International Biodeterioration and Biodegradation Journal from Blanchett was cited 371 times. This article from Nature was cited 211 times, and then it goes down from there. So depending on your topic, it can help you identify those really important articles that are um, that have been cited highly in the field. I'll just note there's other ways to sort here too, but I really like cited by highest. You can also use Scopus to find open access literature. So if you're ever not associated with Towson and you need to find open access literature, or if you are personally hoping to publish your research in an open access journal, you can do that with Scopus. Well, you can get ideas with Scopus. You can't publish with Scopus. So we'll go back to the search results. And on the left, on the filters, the very bottom of the filters, there's an open access button, an open access filter. So there are 807 articles in this field of this uh, search results that are open access. And they may be green, they may be gold, bronze, or hybrid gold which are all different versions of open access that I won't get into today. And um, once you do that, you have to say limit to, and we should see 807. And so you can see that these articles now are open access. You can get an idea of which journals publish open access. PLOS One is a big one. The Journal of Natural Products, Political Geography, 
and so on. So that could give you some really great ideas. So that was articles in Scopus. We'll move on to authors in Scopus. Are there any questions about finding articles in Scopus? One thing I'll note, well, I didn't mention it, but when you're in this database, you should always see a yellow find it button and that should help you get to the actual PDF that you want to read. That's our Towson catalog page. And then here's the record on the journals page. And then here's the PDF. So always look for that yellow find it button. Any questions about articles? Okay, we'll move right along. So you can use Scopus to understand your impact or others' impact. The, um, the asterisk, let me address that real quickly. So if you had a term like, um, re, uh, like let's say therapy, and it might be spelled therapy, therapies, therapeutic or therapeutics, but you didn't wanna type all those, you can put a star and then when you click search, you'll get all those versions. Those are my quick searching tips for you just to save yourself some typing, but still get good results. That's what the star does. Okay, so using Scopus to understand your impact or others impact, you can look by author and look up the author and then you can view their citation trends. And so I'm going to close some windows so I don't get too confused here. We'll go back to Scopus and to get back to the home page, I always click on search here in the top. And you'll notice we searched for documents last, but there's a section to search for authors. So we'll click on that. Now I'm not going to show anybody at Towson, but I'll show another well-known person, Dr. A. Fauci. So we'd like to see this person's research impact. So when we search for last name, first initial, we're going to get people that match that criteria. If you need to narrow it down, you can, but this person seem, happens to be fairly well known. I'm looking for Anthony Fauci at NIAD. And so to get to this author's profile, you click on their name. If you wanted to view their documents, you can click on their documents. The nice thing about Scopus is that everything is pretty interactive. So we'll click on their name. This gives you a profile of this author's work and it takes a little minute to load. So this person has been publishing at least since 1994 uh, probably earlier, but that's when Scopus started to capture things. The blue, lot, the, the bar graphs are their actual documents and the line are the citations on those documents. So they have been cited at least 133,000 times. They have 1,197 documents and an H index of 189. And what does that mean? That means that this person has at least 189 publications that have been cited at least 189 times. So that's pretty phenomenal and unusual. And normally it would be more like a six. You have six documents that have been cited at least six times. Now you might've written seven papers, but six of them have been cited six times. And you can see the most contributed topics for that author over here on the right. Now, if you scroll down, you'll see, again, a list of their documents, uh, the, the citing documents, the preprints. So preprints haven't gone through peer review, haven't been formally published yet, but Scopus is starting to capture preprints. So these are probably very new. They have 2,000, 361 co-authors. So who have they worked with in the past? We'll see. All of these people and more in 41 topics and six awarded grants. Now I'll just note that not every grant shows up here, but some of the big ones do. NIH, National Science Foundation and others. So you could, you could look for the funding that's 
uh, the articles that have been associated with this grant. And that's a new feature. You can save all of their articles to a list. If this is you, you can edit the profile by creating a free account and signing in. I actually forget what more does. Let's take a look. Um, yes, if there were another A. Fauci and you wanted to uh, disambiguate them, you can make a request for that. Okay, questions? So you can look up yourself, you can look up your professors, you can look up other people. Oh, one thing here that's fairly new, if you scroll down, uh, if you go to their documents and you scroll down, they're going to show you the author position. And this, this is pretty new. Um, so in the sciences, usually the last author is the PI or the mentor. And the first author is the person who did most of the writing, right? Well, this shows you that Dr. Fauci has been the last author 51% of the time. Okay, and I'll I'll make a recommendation here to connect your ORCID and a little plug for ORCID. It's a it's not affiliated with any one research institution or organization. It's a group effort on behalf of many research institutions and organizations. It's a open researcher and contributor ID. If you're publishing or planning to publish, it will let you keep all of your stuff in one place. It's sort of like a CV or a resume, and it will, when you prompt it to, go out to look for your publications and pull them into your profile. And it'll stay the same whether you change names, whether you change institutions, and it's a great tool. You can link it to your ORCID, I mean, to your Scopus. So if you were this person, you would say connect to ORCID, you'd log in, and then you'd be able to connect the two so that, so that they can talk to each other. You can also use Scopus to find collaborators. So when we did look for um, documents by keywords, we looked by country and by author. So let's just go back to the search. And I saw that there was a climate change. We'll add another search field, kelp forest. I'll put that star there just for the heck of it. You don't have to, but I do. Okay. So if you were publishing in climate change and kelp forests, we found 350 documents. If you wanted to see who in the world is doing this research and find some collaborators you could reach out to for grad school, for your PhD, you can see here documents by author. You could reach out to Dr. Wernberg if they're still publishing and see if they need any research assistance. That is uh, author metrics. Questions about that? Putting a link for ORCID in the chat. Okay, now let's talk about journal metrics. So you can look up journals and you can kind of see their impact. And I don't want to get too into the weeds on this one, but I'll, t I'll talk about the impact metrics that they capture and create. And so first let's do a known item search. We're going to go to the Scopus homepage. We're going to look for sources. And in this case, we are interested in uh, title, and we are going to say Journal of the American Occupational, uh, American Journal of Occupational Therapy. That's the one. So you see, even if you get it a little bit wrong, it will probably help you out. Here's the source title, the American Journal of Occupational Therapy. It gives you a site score of 2.8 highest percentile, um, we'll have to look that one up. The citations it's had on its documents from 2019 to 2022, 1,500. 
How many has it published in that same period? 55. That's how they get the site score. That's how that is calculated. We'll talk about that in a second. And 54% of those records are cited. You could also browse by subject area. So we could say biology. We could say cell biology. Oops, really? Oh, I left, you have to clear your other search. There we go. So here are journals that are publishing in the subject area of cell biology. And this might help you to compare journals where you want to publish. And again, you'll see the number of citations they've had on the number of documents, which gives us the site score. You can also limit on the left. Um, I, I don't like to pay too much of an attention to journal impact uh, because, well, it's a slippery slope. So then let's go back to search. We'll just use um, the results from our climate change and kelp forest search. And let's say we were really interested in number one. We'll click on number one. And let's see, where's the journal? Scientific reports. You can click on scientific reports from the article record and you'll get some of those metrics over here on the right. And I'll talk about it later in the slides, but you can always hover over these metrics to see what they really mean. So the site score measures the average citations received per document published in this, in this journal. The SJR, which is the Simago Journal Rank, measures weighted citations received by the serial, the journal. And the SNP, the SNP is the source normalized impact per paper and it measures the actual citations received relative to the citations expected for the subject area. So that's really kind of better than a journal impact factor because it's weighted for the subject area. So we looked up a journal from sources. We also looked up a journal from the search function and just by clicking on a record. So we looked at site score. SJR and the SNP. So just to understand what you're looking for, um, and you can compare up to 10 different sources on these metrics. Let me see if I can recall that one. There's so many things you can do with Scopus. So we'll go back to sources and we'll search in a uh, subject area um, history. Okay, we're gonna pick a couple. Two. Um, this one I might have to follow up with you on. Somewhere here, there's a way to compare journals. And I had found it the other day and now it's not readily apparent uh, but this is a pretty good comparison right here. So if you really know which ones you wanted to see, you could do it that way. So there's at least one way to compare journals by their metrics. Any questions so far? Because we're getting down to the last part and I'll probably be able to let you go early unless you have questions. All right, so in Scopus, good, thank you. In Scopus, you can search by funders a couple of different ways. And these aren't going to be uh, funding opportunities. They're probably going to be funding awards that have already happened. So we'll go back here, we'll go to search and I'll draw your attention to this drop-down menu. So far we've been doing, we've been doing searches on keywords, but when you drop down and scroll down, it's not behaving for me today. You can so search by funding information, funding sponsor, funding acronym, or funding number. So if you actually had the grant number of the award, you could search for that. I'll search for the sponsor 
and I will look for uh, National Institutes of Health, and I'll click search. So these are records that have resulted from funding from the National Institutes of Health. And if I were a good librarian, I would have put that in quotes because you saw what it did. Let's try that one more time. It did national and institutes and, uh, all right, that didn't make too much of a difference. So let's look at number one, just to confirm that this is what we actually received in our results. We can look at the record here. And if we scroll down, uh, sometimes there's a section for funding information. Let's take a look. Of course it doesn't behave when I'm trying to actually demonstrate it. Funding details. So you should see that in the record. It will tell you this was funded by the NIH. This are, These are the numbers of the awards and also by NINDS and then Thank you. To compare sources, click on one of the sources and then, okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We'll take a look at that in a second. Yeah, there's so much you can do with Scopus that sometimes I forget. So this could be a useful thing for you to search for funding um, and see what's been awarded and to whom. And also there's then the number. So you could take that funding number and see other uh, publications that have been associated with that funding number. Funding acronym, I'm not sure that would be very helpful. You might search NIH uh, sponsor and funding information, maybe just some keywords. And then the, the other thing you can do is, let me go back to our search history and just open up one of our past, um, let's open the first one, shipwrecks. Again, you can click on any one record and see if the funding information is there, but you can also go to the analyze results section where the very last tile is going to be your funding, your funding sponsor. So remember, there's where we found our funding information on shipwrecks. Um, so we talked about that. Then there's one more thing I wanted to show you and also the source. So let's just double check that. I appreciate you. Um, we'll just click on the journal. Um, Oh, I know what you're saying. Well, I'll scroll back to the top. Yeah. And the right, side. right there on the top corner of the right side. Compare sources. Amen. Thank you so much. I just did it yesterday. And for some reason, I can't remember. So then we picked uh, the CA, a cancer journal for clinicians. And then you can search for additional, so like, like let's say other cancer journals, and you'd be able to compare them again with these tiles. So maybe a better visual comparison. Perfect. Amen. Okay. So then the last part I wanted to show you was looking up institutions. So we're going to go back up to search and we're going to go to affiliations. That's the last tab here. And we can search for any affiliation. You could search for Harvard, you could search for Kansas. Uh, we're going to search for Towson. Uh, you just have to let it think for a second. And this gives us really a broad overview to Towson. Now let's remember the very beginning, I said it's limited to what's indexed in Scopus, but that's really quite a lot. There are 8,211 documents in these subject areas. So you can see that it's even capturing uh, business. It's even capturing <laughs> dentistry. There's, there's some topics in here that you may not expect and you can go through them. You could see the tabs across here. So the affiliation hierarchy, who are we working with? We're working with quite a lot of other people, other institutions and organizations. Including uh, College Park, Johns Hopkins, UMBC, Ohio State, Xiao Zhang Tong University, 
sorry, I probably said that wrong. You can see documents by source. So our uh, most published in serial is lecture notes in computer science, followed by nursing made incredibly easy, ecological modeling and more. And remember it's interactive and even 20 patents, which I'm not sure I've gotten into before, but there are 20 patents affiliated with Towson University, and you can see they're going back to 1995. Um, so I'm going to end there, leave time for questions. Um, yes, you can access these papers via Scopus when you work from home. So let me show you how. If you're working from home, make sure you sign in up here on the top right, off campus, sign in. And then when you access Scopus, you'll see, let me just click on some records here. You'll see that yellow find it button and you'll be able to get to the PDF. Now I will remind you that if there's ever not the option for online access, you can always request it through interlibrary loan. That's a free service to all Towson affiliates. All you need to do is sign in with your TUNet ID and I'll show you how amazing it is. It's already filled out. All I need to do is hit submit. And it's usually, I'm usually notified that it's in my account here within a couple of hours. So yes, definitely you can access it from home. Other questions?